Hello everyone, welcome back. I'll be reviewing the 2022 ACR guideline summary on glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis today. Prior to this 2022 guideline, there was the 2017 guideline. Why is it important to discuss today's topic, you might wonder. Let me throw some questions at you and see if you know how to deal with the following questions or scenarios. First, most of your rheumatology patients are on glucocorticoid, but do you know which ones are actually considered high risk for glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis? And with your limited time in clinic, what questions or chart review should you focus on to answer the, the previous question of who is considered high risk? Should you also get a FRAC score on every single patient that you see as long as they're on glucocorticoid? Mm, or how about a patient who responds really well to Prolia or denosumab and the patient desires to go off of the drug or they like to go on a drug holiday? Do you approve this decision? Well, these are only a few of the questions you'll get to answer confidently after today's talk. The updated guideline from 2022 has many similarities with the 2017 guideline. However, there's a couple of new medications included in the guideline as noted here. And there's a section regarding sequential osteoporosis treatment, which will become very um, relevant in your clinic practice. But today's main talk will be focusing on the 2022 ACR guideline summary, which I have divided into two sections. Section A will be discussing screening slash risk stratification and B, treatment. So let's get started with screening. Who do you think should be screened for GIO? According to the guideline, anyone who has had more than 2.5 milligrams per day for more than three months should be screened. So you can safely say almost everyone from rheumatology clinics should be screened for glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. But where do you begin your search? As you already know, rheumatology cases are complex, so you have limited time already without doing additional osteoporosis screening. That's why I think focusing on the following four factors will help you streamline your questioning and investigation for glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. So, the four factors are number one, history of glucocorticoid use, number two, history of fractures, number three, BMD or bone mineral density, and number four, FRAC score. First, you need to determine patient's history of glucocorticoid use. How much of steroids are they on currently and how much of steroids were they on uh, previously? And for how long were they on steroids for? If they were on medication for a long time, you might even ask for a, um, an average of an annual use. Number two, did they break a bone in the past? And if so, which bone was broken? And in which context was the bone broken? And if you want to be more specific, you can go ahead and ask if there was any fracture in the spine, hip, wrist, or humerus. Third, ask patient if they ever had a bone mineral density, uh, like a DEXA skin. And if yes, do you have access to the record? And what were the results of the test? Lastly, if appropriate, calculate their FRAC score. And I say if appropriate because FRAC scores are just for people who are 40 or older. And you do not need to have a, a bone mineral density to calculate it, although it would be helpful to plug in the number. Let me disk about the BMD and FRAC scores with more details. So DEXA is a, a type of bone mineral density. And based on the value you get, you can categorize each patient into normal, osteopenic, or osteoporotic, or even severe osteoporotic category. T-score of negative 1 to negative 2.5 constitute osteopenia. So anything less than that would be um, osteoporotic, and anything greater than that, than that would be considered normal. And obviously, the picture here on the right is not DEXA scan. Next, we have FRAC score, which is fairly easy to use. You can find a free online tool um, for FRAX. 
and you enter in a few information regarding patient's age, height, weight, um, their social history, medical information to get a score, which gives you an estimate of the risk of having a hip or other major fracture in the next 10 years. You, so you get two values. You get the 10-year risk for the hip and um, for other major fractures. Two things you need to remember again is that number one, FRAX is only for people who are 40 or older. And secondly, there is a correction you need to remember for people who are on higher um, glucocorticoid dose. And the cutoff is pretty low. It's 7.5 milligrams per day. So if a patient, let's say, is on 10 milligrams uh, per day uh, prednisone, you would multiply their 10-year risk of major osteoporotic fracture um, by 1.15 and the hip fracture risk by 1.2. Here's an example of an online calculation tool. By the way, they will ask about the bone um, mineral density. Uh, you could see on number 12, but you can still calculate it without uh, plugging in that number. So I wanted to give you an example here in red. Here is uh, the 10-year probability of fracture percentage without uh, BMD. Um, number 10 on this page asks about secondary osteoporosis, right? So what are some of the causes for secondary osteoporosis? A lot of metabolic, endocrine, liver, kidney disease, even HIV to simplify. But I have included a chart I got from up to date with slightly more extensive lists. So take a minute or two and just review the list. Um, and next, so how often should you check uh, BMD or FRAX? So patients who are not being treated with osteoporosis uh, medications, you could get FRAX and BMD every one to two years. And if they're younger than 40, you only get BMD every one to two years, right? Because FRAX is only for people who are 40 or older. Patients receiving or um, who have completed osteoporosis therapy, uh, BMD, you could get every one to two years. In addition to the four factors I discussed earlier, the glucocorticoid, history, um, history of fractures, BMD, and uh, FRAC score, other things you could look for, out for. In the history, you could ask about significant weight loss. Past medical history, you will go through the secondary causes of osteoporosis. Um, in social history, uh, are they a smoker? Are they a drinker? And also family history, you could ask about parental history of fra hip fracture or other fractures. And I put family history in parentheses because this one is actually not from the guideline, but I thought it was still an important question to ask. F on physical exam, always check their BMI, but when you calculate their FRAC score, it kind of gives it to you. Um, that's why the patient's height and weight are included in the FRAC score questionnaire. Next, we're going to move on to the risk stratification. And you'll see again that the adult patient groups are divided into two separate groups based on age. This is pretty typical when we discuss about osteoporosis. Even in the 2017 guideline, they always divide patients uh, based on age and gender. Um, so let's see. Uh, beginning with the older group, so 40 is always the cutoff. So 40 or older or under 40. There are other factors that will put a patient into a high risk group even without a high FRAC score. And those are number one, the prior osteoporotic fracture, we discussed that before, or um, BMD T-score negative 2.5 or worse, or glucocorticoid dose, so 30 milligrams per day or greater, or cumulative yearly um, dose of five grams. If your patient doesn't have any of the risk factors, now you can look at the FRAC score. The easiest for this, I think, is to know the FRAX for a high risk group and low risk group, and whatever is in between, you will know it's a moderate group. So for the high risk group, the FRAX score, so um, for MOF, it's 20 or greater. For the hip, it's going to be three or greater. And for the low risk group, it's gonna be MOF under 10%, not including the 10. Um, and hip, 
a one or less. So if you are a visual learner like me, it would be easier to draw a diagram to explain this. So I'm going to draw two lines. On the top, it's a risk, fracture risk score for a major osteoporotic fracture. And uh, below here, I'm going to draw a line for the hip fracture. And for the major osteoporotic fracture, the numbers, the intervals gonna be by 10. So zero, 10, 20. And for the hip fracture, it's gonna be interval of one. So one, two, and three. So for the major osteoporotic fracture, we said high risk includes um, 20 or greater. So I'm going to put the arrow up, but I'm going to have the end of the arrow actually touch the line I drew over the number 20. It just means that 20 is included in the risk. And for the low, it doesn't touch number 10 because it does not include the uh, value 10. And if you want, you could put another error in the moderate to determine that, you know, 10 actually uh, means moderate risk. And for the hip in the same way, um, height risk, I'm gonna put another arrow where the number three is touching the line going across. And for the hip, the line's gonna go the other way, but the end of the arrow is gonna touch number one. And if you know how to draw this, it, it, I think soon you'll just memorize the numbers. Um, okay. So let's um, discuss risk stratification for patients who are under 40. Just like the group of 40 and above, prior osteoporotic fracture and glucocorticoid dose greater than 30 per day or cumulative 5 grams per year is considered a high category. But unlike the other group, there is an interesting criteria based on glucocorticoid dose and uh, bone mineral density test result. So glucocorticoid dose of 7.5 milligrams per day um, or greater for more than 6 months um, plus uh, BMD showing hip or spine Z-score less than negative 3 or rapid bone loss 10% or more at the hip or spine over 1 to 2 years will put a patient in the moderate risk category. Otherwise, if none of the risk factors that I mentioned just now are not uh, present, then they are in the low risk category. Um, FYI, T-scores compare your bone density with that of a young adult, while Z-scores compare your bone density with that of your peer group. And you may wonder, what is the whole point of risk stratification? Why do I have to remember all these values and whatnot? Um, is there any clinical relevance? And in fact, yes, there is clinical relevance. Uh, the treatment recommendations from the ACR guideline is actually based on patient, individual patients' risk stratification. And that's why I'm taking the time to explain it to you. So when those recommendations actually do come up in the later in the lecture, you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay, finally, we have arrived to part B, which will discuss and focus on the treatment. I will first review five drug categories used in osteoporosis treatment, which if you don't use it on a daily basis, it could kind of get confusing. Then I will give initial treatment recommendations based on the noted patient characteristics. Lastly, I will end the talk with a couple of recommendations regarding sequential treatment. So let's get started with the five classes of osteoporosis medications. So there are five classes. Number one, bisphosphonates. Everybody kind of knows about bisphosphonates. Number two, CIRM or selective estrogen receptor modulators. Number three, PTH or PTH-related peptide. Number four, anti-rank ligand. Number five, anti-scrostin. Um, 
Um, here I organized the examples of medications you will often encounter, divided into the five um, MOA categories. You probably heard of most of these drugs, especially their brand names, um, either from nighttime TV ads or even posters of these medications in your clinic. Romosozumab um, or Avinity is one of the newer drugs in the market. And um, this can easily be confused with Avista, which is a certain drug, Raloxifene. And the way I try to keep them straight in my head is um, to remember, okay, Avinity ends with the letter Y, which comes after letter A in Avista. And Romosuzumab or Avinity came after Raloxifene or Avista um, in the osteoporosis market. So that's how I try to remember. Um, okay, so let's, I'm not going to go over each um, individual medication here, but um, yes, here is the list that you can ref reference later. In terms of the treatment guidelines, patients on prednisone of 2.5 milligrams per day or more for more than three months is the first group of patient groups they actually have recommendations on. And these patients... Uh, if you remember from the beginning of our talk, these are the patients that need to be screened for glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis, right? So whether they are adults or children, are in the beginning stage of their history or uh, their treatment, or they're continuing on chronic glucocorticoid treatment, whether they're high risk, moderate risk, or low risk, all of these patients should be optimized on their vitamin D level, their calcium intake, and lifestyle uh, modifications. And all additional recommendations that I'm going to present after this slide are in addition to this current recommendation. So let's start with our, or let's move on to uh, the next group, which is adults age 40 or older. We have discussed about what constitute as high, moderate, or low risk. And I put them here in white letters for your convenience and for your reference. For both high and moderate group, giving PO bisphosphonate or not giving osteoporosis medication is strongly recommended. And IV bisphosphonate, PTH or PT, um, PTH related peptide, denosumab or over no osteoporotic medication is conditionally recommended. Using ROM or romosuzumab or CIRM for this group or using CIRM for postmenopausal women is conditionally recommended against with the exception as noted here, patients intolerant of other agents due to their um, risk of life-threatening harms. Also, using two different osteoporosis medications is conditionally recommended against despite them being in the high-risk osteoporosis risk group. By the way, for um, ROM or romosuzumab and CIRM, you'll kind of see the repeated pattern of not using them unless you have no other option. And you may wonder why. It's due to the fact that they have increased cardiovascular disease risk and thrombosis risk. For the moderate risk patients who are 40 or older, using PO or IV bisphosphonate, PTH, PTH related peptide, or denosumab over no osteoporosis therapy is conditionally recommended. And the same recommendation regarding ROM or CIRM or uh, for postmenopausal women on CIRM for, from the high risk group applies here as well. For patients who are 40 or older, um, but if they're in the low risk group, adding any osteoporosis medication um, or adding any osteoporosis medication to calcium, vitamin D, or lifestyle modification is strongly recommended against. Next, we have patients under 40, and I think the overarching theme is kind of similar. So for both high and moderate risk groups, using PO or IV Bisphosphonate, denosumab, or PTH slash PTH related peptide is conditionally recommended. And within the high risk group, patients who are on high glucocorticoid dose of 30 daily or higher, or cumulative yearly dose of 5 grams, IV bisphosphonate, PTH or PTH related peptide, denosumab is recommended over CIRM or uh, ROM due to life threatening risks. And that's a conditional recommendation.
Um, and there's a recommendation against using ROM um, that is conditional due to the risk of life-threatening harms. For the low-risk group, um, as we saw in the other age group, um, adding any osteoporosis medications to calcium, vitamin D, or, or lifestyle modifications is recommended against. There's a few recommendations regarding solid organ tra tra uh, transplant patients with GFR of 35 or higher and people without CKD metabolic bone disease. Um, number one, expert evaluation for CKD, MBD in renal transplant patients are recommended. Number two, personalized treatment uh, with PO or IV bisphosphonate, denosumab, PTH or PTH related peptide or serum based on um, individual individual patient factors is recommended. And three, conditionally recommended against using ROM due to cardiovascular disease risk and lack of safety in this population. Uh, there are a couple of recommendations regarding children. So the first group is low or moderate risk children aged from four to 17. They are conditionally recommended to optimize calcium, vitamin D, and um, starting them on PO or IV bisphosphonate is conditionally recommended against due to the fact that they are low risk for osteoporotic fracture in this age group. But for high risk children, treatment with PO or IV bisphosphonate is conditionally recommended. And to be considered high risk, patients will have had an osteoporotic fracture and are being continued on treatment with glucocorticoid at dose greater than or equal to 0.1 milligrams per kilo per day for more than three months. Lastly, let's talk about sequential treatment. What is a sequential treatment? Let's say you're treating a patient with osteoporosis who improves on um, the current treatment regimen. Patient would like to stop the treatment now and see how things go. Whether you approve of this patient's decision or not will depend on what kind of osteoporosis medication the patient is currently receiving. So out of five classes of osteoporosis medications we discussed earlier, there are two classes of medications that can be stopped without subsequent um, osteoporosis treatment. And they are uh, bisphosphonates and selective estrogen receptor modulators. Um, so these three, PTH slash PTH related peptide, denosumab or romosuzumab, they do need sequential treatment. Um, either with bisphosphonate and denosumab. So these three, PTH, PTH related peptide, denosumab, uh, romosuzumab, these will need to be followed by sequential treatment, either with PO or IV bisphosphonate or denosumab. And in the case of denosumab, um, obviously PO or IV bisphosphonate. Why is that? Why do we need to give sequential treatment? Well, the discontinuation of denosumab after two or more doses is associated with rapid bone loss and development of new vertebral compression fractures as soon as seven to nine months after the last dose. And similarly, discontinuation of PTH or PTH-related peptide without transition to another treatment will lead to rapid bone loss and a new fracture. Uh, discontinuation of romosuzumab also without transition to another treatment will lead to bone loss. So the guideline gives an example of transitioning of denosumab to a bisphosphonate. They do recognize the precise timing, dose, or duration of bisphosphonate use after denosumab cessation is currently under study, but treatment for um, is recommended for at least one year. So recommendation of one to two years of bisphosphonate. And bisphosphonate treatment is recommended to begin at six to seven months after the last dose of denosumab. Um, what if patient remains high risk when initial osteoporosis treatment and glucocorticoid are discontinued? Um, the guideline recommends a sequential treatment. So you can either continue with the current treatment or you could switch to IV bisphosphonate, denosumab, PTH, PTH related peptide serum, or romosuzumab. So how do you feel after this talk? Do you feel like you could answer a lot of the questions I asked from the beginning of the talk? I sure hope so. Um, here's a quick summary. 
Have a very low threshold for screening in rheumatology offices, as most of our patients are on glucor glucocorticoid dose higher than 2.5 mg per day for more than three months. Quantity of steroids, including cumulative dose, matters, so ask about it, or you could chart check. Four things you can focus on during your busy rheumatology clinic is one, steroid dose, two, history of fractures, number three, uh, bone mineral density, and number four, FRAC score. And to use FRAC score, patients should be at least 40 years of age. And if they're on more than 7.5 milligrams per day of glucocorticoid dose, remember to multiply FRAC scores by 1.15 um, times 10 year risk of major osteoporosis fracture and 1.2 times the hip fracture risk. Also, FRAX is used for patients who have not been treated in the past for osteoporosis. Risk stratification uh, is important before deciding to start the osteoporosis medication in the first place. Know the five classes of osteoporosis medications and know which of them will need sequential treatment. Okay, we did cover a lot today, but before we end, here's a bonus slide. Um, I do want to bring to your attention this figure from 2017 ACR guideline on glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis. This guideline has helped me tremendously in answering what seemed like an obscure osteoporosis questions on my practice exams when I was prepping for the boards. And a lot of it was from this figure where um, it describes about the first line and second line therapies for different groups. Across the boards, it seems like first line therapy uh, for osteoporosis seems to be PO bisphosphonate. However, the second line was different for childbearing age patients. Um, instead of going to IV bisphosphonate, teriparatide became, became the next option. And because this guideline was so helpful in prepping me for my boards, I wanted to share it as a bonus slide. As always, my lectures are only meant to supplement your own studies and just use it as a guide, but do your due diligence, um, download the guidelines and read them yourselves and see what you think. I wish you best of luck and I hope to see you next time.